Welcome back. We'll be discussing setting, description, and world building today. For myself, when I was working on my novel, which is set in Detroit, I did a lot of research. And one of the things that happens when you do research is you find these tidbits, these just great bits of history or objects, and you want them in your book, but you don't really have any reason or you don't know why they would be in your book. They just they seem fun. For me, um, there was a specific hotel that I researched that was set in the 1940s in Detroit, and it was the first black hotel in the city. And I wanted it in my novel, but for several drafts, there was no reason for it to be there. Um, it wasn't until I realized that I had a character who was trying to impress a woman, a woman who had more money than him, that I had a reason to have that, not, that, that hotel in, in the story. He tries to take her to that hotel, and it backfires horribly. But outside of that context, it's just a historical tidbit that lives outside of the characters and it has no real depth. It's not rooted in the narrative itself, but once it was part of the character's desires and his motivations, then it feels very particular. Yeah. So the, the trick is to find the right setting for that object, for that building, so that it will come to life. Exactly, and the right like lens to view that object through. Yeah. And so for this session, we'll hear from Peter Orner, who will talk about how you create setting through description, description being the key to building a world. And then Leslie Jameson will talk about creating a setting by inventing an inventory of objects. This reminds us of William Carlos Williams' famous line that no ideas but in things. And we begin to understand how each thing has resonance when put in its right setting in a, in a work of fiction. Finally, Paul Harding will discuss creating a setting the reader can experience through detailed landscapes and sensory attention. Paul is the author of two novels, most recently Enon. His first book, Tinkers, won the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction in 2010. He graduated from the University of Massachusetts and the Iowa Writers' Workshop, and he has also received a Guggenheim Fellowship. He has taught at Harvard, and now he is a visiting professor at the Iowa Writers' Workshop. Leslie Jameson is the author of two books, most recently, The Empathy Exams. Her debut novel, The Gin Closet, was a finalist for the Los Angeles Times' first fiction prize. She graduated from Harvard University and the Iowa Writers' Workshop, and she is currently a Ph.D. candidate in American literature at Yale University. And Peter Orner's most recent book, Last Car Over the Sagamore Bridge, is a New York Times editor's choice and was named the favorite book of 2013 by the Wall Street Journal. He was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship as well as the two-year Lannan Foundation Literary Fellowship. Orner is a professor of creative writing at San Francisco State University and has taught at the University of Iowa Writers Workshop. Enjoy. Hi, I'm Leslie Jamison, and I'm here at the University of Iowa, and what I would love to talk about a little bit today is building the world of your story. Um, I mean this in a few different ways, but on a very basic level, what I'm interested in is how we build the physical world that the narrative inhabits. So sometimes people have different words that they use for this. Sometimes people talk about setting. Uh, I prefer the word world to the word setting because to me world suggests something active and something interactive and um, something that is actually playing a role in the story. When we think of setting or sometimes when I think of setting I think of something that's much more static, something that's in the background. Um, but what I'd like to suggest about a world is it's not just sort of the physical objects that populate your story but um, a set of kind of dynamic variables that can actually change the way that you're seeing your characters and change the way that their plot lines are unfolding. So if you build your world right, it can be something that surprises you, kind of turns against you in interesting ways. And that's what I'd like to explore a little bit today. Um, one thing that I often do when I'm building the worlds of my stories, either in fiction or nonfiction, is I write up something that I call a world glossary. And I was inspired in this endeavor by the author Ben Marcus, who has a book called The Age of Wire and String. And certain sections of that book are labeled as glossaries. The world of that book is a very strange book. It's a world where things happen that don't happen in our world. The, 
people are powered by hunger and wind. People eat things we don't eat in our world. But what I love about these glossary sections is that you'll have um, basically a kind of map made with words. So he'll define um, places, he'll define objects, and through those definitions, you don't just get a sense of what you might touch or see or smell, you get a sense of the rules of his world, how people play together, how people fight each other. Um, so sometimes when I'm sitting down to build a world, I will create something like a world glossary. Um, and it doesn't, you know, I've, I've written things that take place in strange worlds, and that can be one interesting use for that glossary, but you can use a glossary even if the world of your story as, is something as ordinary as a coffee shop or a classroom. The idea behind the glossary is just pick out a lot of different elements of that world and as you focus in on each element, um, just let your mind play. Let your mind play with all the possibilities. Um, for if you're describing a chair, let your mind play with all the different uh, things that chair could mean to various characters. What, um, whose feelings were hurt in that chair? Who was betrayed in that chair? Uh, who uh, broke into his father, his estranged father's property to chop down the, the tree whose wood was used to build that chair? Um, so let, let these different parts kind of extend in different directions, follow the various vectors of possibility. Um, and so that's kind of the idea of the glossary is that you'd have a series of discrete units, but each unit is kind of spilling over and exploding in ways you might not have expected. Um, and I think one of the things that I really appreciate about the glossary exercise and about kind of brainstorming exercises in general is that when I'm in the process of drafting, um, it can get exhausting to just sit down every day in front of your computer and push the narrative forward, write another scene, um, you know, uh, push yourself, push your characters into dialogue, push your action to the next stage of unfolding. Um, so sometimes if I'm feeling exhausted by that part of the process, the pushing the story forward part of the process, um, I can see things like building a glossary as a way to take a break from that forward momentum. So it often takes the pressure off of me for the space of a day or a morning or an hour um, because I won't be thinking in terms of scene or plot. I'll be thinking for that period of time in terms of exploration. And that can give me a good feeling of relief and it can give me a good feeling of liberation and kind of just break open the possibilities of the story a little bit more. Um, so. That's something to think about as a way to um, kind of take a sabbatical from the forward trajectory of, of what you're doing when you're writing. Um, and another thing that I often think about when I'm trying to consider how the world of a story can be more than just a backdrop um, is trying to think about the relationship between these two worlds that are always taking place simultaneously on the page. And that's the physical world of a story and the emotional world of that story. Um, and to me, one of the most exciting parts of writing is thinking about how those two worlds are intersecting. So um, often this comes back to a question of perspective for me, um, something I think about in terms of uh, I, I used to have a writer friend and we would, uh, with whom I would talk about this idea of heartbreak sunglasses, by which we meant the way that whatever the emotional reality is um, for a character in your story, that's going to completely set the terms of how they're engaging with the physical landscape of that story. So um, if you're in the midst of heartbreak, you're essentially wearing a pair of sunglasses that is shading and inflecting everything around you with the kind of force of that emotional experience. Um, so there are a ton of different ways to kind of play around with that. Um, but one thing that I like to do, actually I do it as a writer and I do it as a teacher, is taking a single physical object and thinking about what elements of that object would come to the foreground, would become visible, prominent, 
remarkable in the context of different um, emotional experiences. So how would the same table look to somebody who is um, totally triumphant after just running the fastest cross-country race of his life? How would that table look to somebody whose mother has just died? How would that table look to a five-year-old girl who just gotten a new puppy? Like you can imagine all the different ways that table would play out. Everything from something as simple as a table to somebody who just finished a huge cross-country mace might look like a really amazing place to take a nap. Or a table to a little girl who just gotten a puppy might look like... Um, a really, a really good place to spread out a bunch of dog food. A table um, for somebody who just lost their mother might remind them of every single childhood dinner they'd ever shared with her. Um, so thinking about how, you know, when you're describing the world of a story, you're doing multiple kinds of creative labor at once. Um, you're not just setting into place pieces of a landscape in which your characters are moving around you're also getting the chance to do some major work to sort of show the gears that are turning inside of those characters, show what's important to them, show what's haunting them so fully that nothing in their gaze, nothing in their perspective is like escaping the uh, sway of whatever that emotional situation is. Um, and one of the passages to me in all of literature that got me thinking about the power of emotion to determine how we engage with the physical landscape of a narrative um, is a passage from Anna Karenina, um, and I'll just set it up really briefly, um, although it's a pretty simple emotional situation to understand. Uh, there's a character named Levin who has been in love with a woman named Kitty for a very long time, and he proposed to her at one point and was refused. And at this point in the course of the novel, he's proposed to her a second time uh, in a very wonderful way, and she's accepted, but they're in this strange in-between space where she's accepted his proposal, so he knows that this thing he's long wanted to happen is actually going to happen, um, but they haven't told her family yet. So there's basically the space of an evening and a dawn where he knows that this good thing is going to come true, but it kind of hasn't become official yet. Um, so he's in that space where his joy is still a private thing. It's still something he has sole custody over. Um, and he's basically wandering the streets um, to kill time before he goes back to her home to formally request her hand in marriage. All that night and morning, Levin lived perfectly unconsciously and felt perfectly lifted out of the conditions of material life. He had eaten nothing for a whole day. He had not slept for two nights, had slept several hours undressed in the frozen air, and felt not simply fresher and stronger than ever, but felt utterly independent of his body. He moved without muscular effort and felt as if he could do anything. He was convinced he could fly upwards or lift the corner of the house if need be. He spent the remainder of the time in the street, incessantly looking at his watch and gazing about him. And what he saw then, he never saw again after. The children, especially, going to school, the bluish doves flying down from the roofs to the pavement, and the little loaves covered with flour, thrust out by an unseen hand, touched him. Those loaves, those doves, and those two boys were not earthly creatures. It all happened at the same time. A boy ran towards a dove and glanced, smiling, at Levin. The dove, with a whir of her wings, darted away, flashing in the sun, amid grains of snow that quivered in the air, while from a little window there came a smell of fresh-baked bread, and the loaves were put out. Um... So a few things that struck me the first time I ever read that passage and actually still strike me every time I read it um, are this idea that gets articulated partway through and what he saw then he never saw again after. That is a powerful idea to me for a couple reasons. And one is that these, these things that he saw then, if you think about what they really are in that passage, they're very 
ordinary things, their children on the street, their loaves of bread being put out, their doves flying, um, uh, grains of snow quivering in the air. I mean, these are things that he's seen before and he no doubt will see again. Um, but the point is he'll never see them again like he's seeing them in this moment. He'll never see them again suffused with this particular intensity, this quality of joy. Um, and that's, that's what I think this passage is such a beautiful illustration of, the way that what we're getting after whenever we paint the physical environment of a narrative is that kind of singularity, like show us show us a world we've never seen before and we've never seen again. And you don't have to create that world, um, create that kind of singularity by constructing a world that is uh, completely outlandish and defies every law of physics we've ever learned or believed in. You can create that kind of singularity simply by overlaying an emotional reality over that physical reality in, in a way that's never been done before in, in quite that sense. So um, put, put that intersection of character experience and physicality, get those vectors crossed in a way that's unique and in a way that yields something like the intensity of this passage, the way that we're seeing an ordinary streetscape animated by a particular set of emotions. Um, so, and to, to me, one of the things that's so rewarding about that is it's a, about figuring out how the emotional and physical worlds of a story connect is that it, it creates this kind of symbiotic relationship where your understanding of the physical world and your understanding of the character's emotional situation is getting, it's like a feedback loop where each is informing the other. So um, let's say you... Let's say you come into a particular scene in a story with a really clear sense of what the room looks like. You know what the couch is like. You know that there's a cup of old coffee that's partway gone cold in the corner. You know the mom smells weird because her kids are too, uh, you know, too afraid to tell her um, that she smells weird because she'll feel bad about it. You, you know all these things. But maybe once you start writing the scene... Um, the physical world comes alive in ways that you hadn't quite expected. So maybe, say, if you're writing a scene between a son and his mother that's happening in that room, that room you'd imagine so specifically, um, in the course of their unfolding interaction, let's say they have some kind of fight, things are rising up out of that physical scene that maybe you hadn't imagined or hadn't anticipated. Um, maybe the, the son, in the course of that fight, notices a set of um, cigarette burns on the couch and starts wondering who else has been hanging out there. Maybe that occasions a new revelation in his conversation with his mother. Um, there are ways that physical details can kind of rise up unbidden um, out of the course of a scene unfolding in a way that lets the physical world you've made become something more like a character, something more like a character and its ability to surprise you. Um, and so that's, um, that's this really electric possibility, I think, that comes out of um, the fact that you're constantly juggling both the emotional and the physical textures of a given scene or of a given story. Um, and sometimes I like to, I mean, you can certainly explore that on the level of an entire narrative, but sometimes I find it um, pretty exciting and generative to think about that on a much smaller scale. So uh, like... The example I gave earlier of the table, sort of limiting yourself to one particular object and then describing that object from, um, you know, five or six very, very different uh, emotional situations. How would it be seen from inside those situations? Or you can sort of expand from the scale of an object to something more like an entire physical environment, um, a cabin in the woods, a canoe on a lake, um, a rodeo in the middle of the summer, and think about, again, how that entire, uh, how the physicality of that entire environment would be shaped by a character kind of being trapped inside some kind of strong emotional situation, how you can see Seek that feeling when you build a physical world of this world with this character is being seen and experienced in a way that uh, never happened before and will never happen again after. Hi, um, I'm here at the International Writing Program at the University of Iowa and uh, honored to be here and uh, it's great to be back in Iowa City and I, I was asked um, to give a, a 
brief, very brief craft talk. Um, and uh, in thinking about what I was going to talk about today, I, I've been coming to the conclusion over the years, and especially lately, that that I that it's very difficult for me to talk about craft divorced of content, so that uh, a craft issue, point of view, or um, you know, uh, um, something that is technical, it's hard for me to sort of isolate on that um, without talking about actual content, something. I need, I need content to, to get into it. And so with that in mind, um, uh, I, I'm going to read a, a short piece and then, and then say a few things about it. Um, one thing that I've been thinking about lately is why certain images, certain scenes, certain aspects of books stick for many, many years. What is it about the, the moments in some fiction that we, as we read in our lives, what is it about some things that just, they never quite go away? And I've been trying to sort of isolate on some of those um, scenes, those moments. So lately I've been thinking a lot about a scene in, in a great novel by the British novelist Henry Green. The novel is called Loving. Green uh, was a, a great novelist who wrote some of the strangest books I know of, and I cherish them. He was published by, uh, among other people, Virginia Woolf, the Hogarth Press. Um, and he was a, he, he sold a few books in his lifetime, not that many, but he was, he was, you know, kind of revered by certain writers for how incredibly different his, his, uh, his approach to fiction was. And so um, I'm going to read this passage, but first I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. And that is that this is something I remember for years and years after reading it. It's the waltzing scene in Loving. It involves two maids in an Irish castle during World War II who go into a closed part of the castle that they're working in. It's closed off because they're sort of, they're sort of circling the wagons. They have this castle, but the entire castle isn't being used. So they go to a disused part of the castle. They turn on some music and they dance a waltz. And in my mind, this, this, this scene, this moment takes up a great deal of space and I can totally visualize it. And lately I went back and actually read the scene, and it's no more than 11 lines, and much smaller in real life on the page than it is in my head. They were wheeling in each other's arms, heedless at the far end where they had drawn up one of the white blinds. Above, from a rather low ceiling, five great chandeliers swept one after the other to the waxed parquet floor, reflecting in their hundred thousand drops the single sparkle of a distant day. Again and again, red velvet paneled walls and two girls, minute and purple, dancing, multiplied to eternity in these trembling pairs of glass. You're daft, Ronce called out. They stopped with their arms about each other. Then, as he walked up, they disengaged to rearrange their hair, and still the waltz thundered. He switched it off, the needle grated. Period. That's it. That is the entire great and, to my mind, famous waltzing scene in Loving. And in my mind, it's like totally exploded and I see them back and forth, back and forth in this empty room with the chandelier and the light and these two beautiful women uh, dancing together while the butler, who's in love with one of them, comes and interrupts them, wrecks the scene and destroys the moment. Um, but what I'm saying is, is and, and something I've been thinking a lot about in my own stuff, and, and for you all who's ever going to watch this, is to think about those scenes, those moments in books that you return to again and again in your mind. And it may be something as um, small, in some sense, as this tiny waltzing scene. But for me... Um, it's blown up in my imagination and really is my memory of that book. And I think that that's probably true for a lot of readers. And so I think as writers, I think it's our job to create these kinds of scenes. And we can do so 
is not so many words if you get the right words right. And uh, for me, when I think about the reflecting off of the chandelier, the light reflecting in a hundred thousand drops, the single sparkle of distant day again and again, it's that reflection, it's that multiplication that seems to me to be one of the elements of this incredibly beautiful passage that makes it stick. But the question isn't how technically we get it to stick, it's how somehow magically we, we with just few, few, very few words, were able to um, make something last. And that is a, a mystery that I'm still trying to solve. Thanks a lot. Hi, I'm Paul Harding. I'm here to talk with you a little bit about um, setting and place when you're doing your writing. Um, in particular, um, I uh, spend a lot of my own time and my, and, uh, my own fiction um, devoting my attention to landscape. I write a lot of fairly lyrical, pastoral prose. From my own experience, um, landscape laid claim to me early and often in my life because I grew up on the North Shore of Boston, near where writers like Ralph Waldo Emerson and um, Thoreau and uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne and a little bit to the West, Emily Dickinson um, all lived. And so as I was a kid growing up and going through the woes of, you know, youth and adolescence, um, that landscape was the kind of objective correlative to my emotional, my inner emotional life. So when I got a little bit older and started to read these writers and saw how they used landscape in their own intellectual, philosophical, poetic, um, aesthetic um, tradition, uh, it really sort of opened the world up to me with, with writing. The, the way I always think of landscape is even though there's a lot of landscape in my writing, I um, never think of writing landscape um, in and of itself. The landscape is never the subject of my writing. The landscape is an object of my writing. Usually landscape is, um, I, I look at landscape as um, being refracted through character so that I'm never writing about, merely writing about, you know, sun-dappled creek water or birch bark or pretty trees and sunlight. I'm writing about those things as they are being refracted through and experienced by a particular character. So in that sense, what it does is it makes the realm and the sphere of character all the deeper. It's a, a, the, the external world becomes an extension of character. So when I approach landscape, I approach it through character. I observe the landscape through the lens of the character, through the lens of the character's circumstances, his or her disposition, um, the place in the plot, the place in, you know, the dram in, within the dramatic arc of the whole story. Um, Often, too, when I think about voice, the, um, the voice in which the landscape is rendered, um, the diction through which it's rendered, um, is, has to do with character as well. Now, I don't, when I, when I talk about voice, I don't mean necessarily um, uh, dialect or the way a character speaks or the syntax. I think of it more in terms of um, what a particular character would be seeing and not not seeing, what, they, what the character would be observing and not observing depending on their disposition. As an author though, what I'm always looking for um, when I'm describing landscape, but when I'm describing anything, I think this is applicable to anything about what you're writing, which is um, to me, the best style of writing is always precision. It's always exactitude. Um, sometimes this, this, this sort of mingles or is synthesized with voice in interesting ways, but for me, in my experience, the best thing to do is worry about voice second, worry about precision first. Try to bring yourself down into the fictional world. In this case, if it's setting, try to just calm yourself down and sit and be very quiet and look and listen and don't be too willful. Don't impose what you think you should be seeing. Don't hurry to what you think the reader really wants. Just there's a certain quietude that you need and, and, and a certain type of intensity of observation and a certain um, cultivating a certain discipline of sustaining 
the intensity of that observation. And as you're doing that, just try to render precisely exactly what it is that you see. Voice will almost inevitably arise out of that. You can always add voice or add tone or tweak it or calibrate it in subsequent drafts. But this is largely, I'm also, I guess I'm talking largely about the first draft as well, which is when I, when I write, when I observe, when I, I, I think of it as sort of taking dictation, I think of myself as almost being an amanuensis, sort of the signal comes through the universe and I'm just there to take down what I see. You can do this anywhere. See, this is a very supremely democratic process, you know. Um, so you, you, you're there to just sort of take down what you see. So I was a drummer in a rock band in a former life. So I think of this process very, very intimately, um, or, or it's, it's very closely um, analogous to um, the highest levels of improvisation in jazz music. The advantage we have as writers is that we can go back and, and revise it. <laughs> if you're doing it live in the club and it screws up, you screw up and it's part of the performance. But here, it's more um, a matter of, again, going back to writing as precisely as you can, getting the technical aspects of the writing down so that you can catch whatever comes over the wire with, um, the, it, with the finest prose available. Then you can revise it later. Um, but, and then I think through all of this process, things like voice, character, will, be, will naturally come through. Um, this also has to do, too, with um, your, like, in the deeper sense, your voice as a writer, which is, um, I often think that each of us, our, our brains physiologically are, you know, 99.99% .99 the same. But the difference is a fraction of a percentage, but that's the thing that makes your writing, your brain, like your fingerprint, like nobody else will write that way. But you have to listen very closely for that. It can be obliterated if you're too willful. Um, so this, none of this is gospel, of course, but I think these are some of the things that um, make it so that if you read a page of, say, William Faulkner, you'll never mistake him for Eudora Welty. Nobody ever reads Faulkner and thinks, hmm, who could that be? Um, so the 99% that we all hold in common is what makes our literature and our art recognizable to one another across cultures, across time, across space, across language, but it's that fraction of 1% that's yours and only yours that makes it indelibly yours and unrepeatably and irreducibly yours. So this all goes back to landscape and, 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 and setting and place as well, which is that you know, you know more about the landscape and the setting and the place um, than anybody else can tell you from the outside. So this is why you have to call it like you see it and not write about landscapes in ways that are in any way preconceived, prefabricated, off the rack. Um, and it's, it's very difficult um, because you can be self-conscious in all sorts of different ways. And a large part of writing about anything is um, deliberately sort of making yourself innocent of what you think you already know. Um, and in that case, uh, it can, that can take a little bit of work. Um, for example, if you're writing about the landscape in which you grew up, a lot of, about, of which you, you will take for granted because it's just there every single day. But when you stop and, say, and see, oh, there's sunsets that's w this way, the sun moves this way, it's at this angle, at this season, that sort of thing, it's in taking the time to observe those things and figuring out how to render them in the most precise language possible. It is out of that process which arises the real revelations that you're looking for in your writing. And just as a writer, you just have to just pay close attention. And a lot of times, I mean, it's sort of surprising and maybe initially a little bit unsettling, but have faith, I promise you it works, um, which is you walk around your daily life, you, you, have to, you have to move through your daily life according to habituated perception, because otherwise you'll never tie your shoes, you won't get to work, you won't submit your essay on time, whatever it is that you have to do. But if you stop and take a step back from habituated perception, what you'll find is that a lot of what you just kind of reflexively and presumptuously think of as paying attention is not paying attention at all.
You're not paying attention to anything. Paying attention is, you know, we often think, oh, I'm paying attention so I don't get run over by a bus, but that's not the type of attention that we're talking about that you need to dilate your consciousness. You need to dilate your self-awareness to sort of like include yourself <laughs> in your self-awareness and to say, I'm actually not thinking. What is thought? You know, I'm not actually paying attention. What is paying attention? I love to just look at paintings and I'm obsessed with color. Um, and I'm obsessed with the fact that I can look at a painting and just be knocked out. You know, like I like the Hudson River School painters, Cole and uh, Frederick uh, Church, all those guys. Um, one of the things that astonishes me about that is thinking about how would I even go about taking paint and combining it and turning it into the colors that ended up on the canvas. And the few embarrassing times I've tried to do that, the distance between what they can do and what I can do is so vast that it just sort of fills me with awe. And one of the ways that's, for example, then, that I walk around and pay attention to landscape is I always stop and ask myself, what color is the sky? It's not blue, or if it is blue, it's not just like blue, blue. You know, what color are the leaves? What does the light look like? I think about color a lot. And just think about the fact that, like, if I tried to put that into words, it would be much more difficult to accurately reproduce what I'm seeing right now in the landscape onto paper with a degree of precision that would take what I'm actually seeing and put it into another reader's mind. And so if you just start thinking about it in that way, um, that's the type of attention. Like I said, it can be a little bit intimidating because you think well, that's, that's a lot of attention. And it is, but you can do it because it's just a matter of just, again, it's a matter of habit. And that even goes back to what I was talking about, about kind of making yourself innocent of presumption. Don't presume that you know what you're seeing and can just and just, and, and, and just kind of tack it in or just insert it, cut it and paste it into your description. It always bears um, your closest attention. Uh, so I've been talking mostly about landscapes to which you may be native. Um, if you find yourself writing about uh, other worlds or other landscapes, or you know, um, whether they be real or wholly imagined, I think you can apply a lot of the same... Um, principles to this, which is it all has to do with how deeply you imagine, how thoroughly you imagine, how far you pursue the landscape in your own imagination. The way uh, fiction convinces its readers of its authenticity um, has to do with the fact that fiction is an art form that largely deals with our imminence. We are imminent beings. We are embodied. And so what a lot of the best fiction does is um, it immerses the reader into what feels, while you're reading it, um, something like an imminent physical experience. Um, and so what you're basically constantly doing is appealing to the reader through her senses. What does it look like? What does it smell like? What does it taste like? What does it sound like? What does it feel like? So to the extent that you're imagining yourself into an imaginary um, landscape or setting, or a setting that you maybe have to do some research about. Um, you can direct your imagination and your research and synthesize the two towards thinking about that kind of just the very palpable, tactile, um, immediate physical experience of being in that setting. So in that sense, it can be, it's a very nuts and bolts sort of thing, you know, before you want to rush off and get into metaphorical meaning or symbolism or meaning with a capital M, you know, there has to be, you know, dirt on the ground and it has to smell like sulfur and the sky has to be red or something like, you know, whatever that is. So the reader needs to be habituated to place and to time and to setting before you can then begin to build on deeper experiential meanings of you know being being in that place. So there is a lot of very nuts and bolts physicality to all of this. Um, it also, in my experience, it took a leap of faith. I always wanted to just, you know, it doesn't matter whether the apple is green or red, it just matters, matters that the apple is symbolic of the fall of all of humanity. It, fiction tends to not work that way. It doesn't work from symbol down. It works from the mud and the clay in which your feet are sunk up or actually in. Um, if, since it's imminence too, it's not so much that you're trying to transcend the experience of humans in, say, a landscape or setting. It's tr you're trying to penetrate as deeply into that experience as possible. And to that extent, we are, we are creatures of clay. Um, 
even if we are imbibed with souls, you know. So we experience our souls through a material, a material existence. Um, so that's a two. You can have all sorts of fun with this. I mean, one of the things that I do with my writing when I'm, you know, writing about landscape, setting, place, time, character, anything, is I think about these things also in terms of other art forms. So, for example, uh, you know, we're talking about different senses. So when you hear music, one of the ways that music creates depth and dimension is through counterpoint, it's through harmony, it's through overtones and undertones. You can use the verbiage from other idioms and other types of art um, to think about what would the equivalent of that be when I'm describing a landscape. When you are looking at landscape, I often go to the museum and I look at landscape painting. Um, counterpoint in music is like contrast of light and dark in painting. If you look at a lot of classic landscapes, what you'll notice is that the foreground is very dark and the furthest point is the lightest point. And what that does is actually pulls dimension out of that landscape you can do that too, just by describing in words what paint and color do and light and using light um, does it, you know, does it through the medium of paint. Um, another thing that's really fun too is when you're working with different scales um, and when you're working with, um, with getting um, sort of the large and the small together. And this, this has to do also with trying to get meaning with a capital M and taking the sort of, you know, coupling the infinite with the infinitesimal, you know, getting star gushing galaxies um, and little pebbles in the creek together. Um, that is um, a, a wonderful thing to do. I mean, I often have my, my characters are often miniaturists because I'm a miniaturist. I spent a lot of my you know childhood making little boats out of grass and straw and sending them off down, down, the, little, down the little rivulet, you know, but that rivulet if you look at a if you look at a satellite photograph of the Earth, that rivulet looks exactly like the North American continent draining through the Mississippi Delta. So you can always it's always scalable. Um, you know, the, any given thunderstorm or bank of fog can be compared to the storms on Jupiter. You know, so it has to do with putting the large next to the small, the light next to the dark. It's just polarity. You drape the world in between polar opposites and the sort of, it creates these sort of magnetic fields of meaning. Um, the author I've been thinking about a lot, who, who does this just brilliantly and almost sense by sense, is Herman Melville. Moby Dick is a sort of object lesson in how to do that. He's always basically talking about, you know, God and hardtack, <laughs> you know, and so it's always the most sacred, the most profound, the largest, most universal cosmological ideas are constantly being understood in the most modest terms of the most modest human lives. And all of those things, the, the grandeur and the humility are available to every single one of us all of the time. It's just also a matter of habituating yourself to where you look for it. It's always there, but again, that goes back to making yourself innocent of what it is you think you're gonna see before you actually start to look and, and take, it, take things down. So say you have your initial description of your setting, you have the initial description of the landscape, you plunk the characters down in and there's that kind of chapter one description. The way that you um, prevent yourself from just mere repetition is that the character is existing in time. And so, I mean, in the most literal sense, but we're th you, you can think about it, because since you're an artist, you can think about it in the aesthetic sense, but the literal kind of foundation upon which you can approach the description of the same landscape in chapter nine as you do in chapter 15 or whatever, is that um, if any amount of time has passed, the character who is walking through that landscape, even if it's the same character, is literally not the same person anymore. There has been intervening experience that will, again, even if it's just minuscule, even if it's just a fraction of a degree, will change that character's perception of moving through that same landscape or getting up that morning, getting up the, you know, on Friday morning rather than Monday morning with a cup of coffee and looking out at the valley. Um, the, the, the valley will not be the same valley. It will not look the same to the character. Um, and it actually won't be because seasons change and actually if you notice the light, the clouds, the, sea, every, the landscape never is the same. So you can put yourself on the hot seat and, 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 and discipline yourself according to the premise that if you feel like you're describing the landscape repetitively, it's you, it's not the landscape. <laughs> you know, which just means the landscape is different and that goes back, that kind of loops back into 
the precision of observation. So you trust your subject, trust your landscape, trust your character, trust your powers of observation, and trust your reader. Because if you're constantly keeping your reader that intimately inside the character's experience, inside the experience of reading your novel, any slight change in the landscape will be amplified in the reader's apprehension of it. Um, because you have been um, maintaining that intimacy with it th throughout the whole narrative, throughout the whole work. And in fact, an incredible book to read and to look at for tiny, minuscule human beings in outsized, um, astonishing landscapes that seem so large that they seem monolithic, but they actually shift and change in very beautiful ways is um, Willa Cather's novel called Death Comes for the Archbishop. Um, Willa Cather in general is actually incredible to, to, um, to look at. Uh, Shadows on the Rock, which is about a, a father and his daughter in Quebec City, I think in the 18th century maybe. That's also just beautiful. You know, Quebec is up on cliffs. But just, just notice that because some of the most devastating kind of soul-shaking effects actually come from you look at the same landscape for the 10th time and suddenly one little thing is different and that one difference changes the entire universe. You know, again, because it's experiential. You know, you get up one day and you look at the world in a different way and it just one little thing changes everything, you know, so it's that the intimacy and the precision of detail and the significance of detail. And this also goes back to, you know, when you're describing a landscape, you're not, you're trying to describe it comprehensively and precisely, but not necessarily exhaustively. You're not writing indices, you're not writing you're not making a catalog of details. You're choosing details. You're choosing the most important details. You're observing and giving relative value to details and then constellating them in arrangements that, um, that, that, that give, again, the reader, the reader but telescoping through the character the most profound experience of them. First of all, your writing will always fall into one or another long-standing tradition. Um, and so it behooves you to, um, to read in that tradition and understand the conventions of that tradition so that then when your writing sort of overlaps with it, you can, with the highest degree of specificity and artfulness, um, satisfy or confound the expectations that are within that tradition. Um, also, what every single tradition that exists one of one or more of in which you will write um, comes with predictable dangers and pitfalls. The danger of writing um, pastoral lyric prose is that you can um, just become drunk on the language. You can just end up kind of spiraling off into moon, June, spoon. So the danger is that you will write prose that is pretty but not beautiful. Um, one of the great leaps of faith that I had to take was understanding that the poetry and the beauty and the lyricism lies and pre-exists um, you, the writer, coming along. It lies in the subject itself. So it has to do with the function of trusting your subject. If that beauty and lyricism is already in the landscape, it's there because by virtue of being itself, not by virtue of the fact that I come along and I'm a poetic writer and so I slather lyrical beauty all over it. The beauty doesn't come from there. The beauty comes from me, um, again, closely observing, observing the landscape and writing about it as precisely as possible. And when I started thinking about that, you know, even in terms of writing pastoral, writing with lyricism, um, those seemed antithetical to ideas or concepts like precision, exactitude, which sound like they're from mechanical drawing or engineering, which seems like you'll destroy the beauty and the poetry and the music. But I was more terrified of writing purple, melodramatic, sing-songy garbage. So I just gave myself over to that exactitude and that precision. What I found is that the prose I wrote was all the more lyrical, all the more beautiful, pastoralia, all the more lovely, um, and kind of serious and shattering and sort of um, immune to sentimentalization. As an artist, what I do is I always subordinate myself to my subjects. Again, like I said, I'm there as the amanuensis. I'm just there to take dictation, not to impose my will 
on the subject, you know. Trusting your subject has to do with understanding the fact that the subject is its own best description. It embodies its own meaning. So therefore, it's already there. You don't have to add anything to it. You just describe it as it, as it is. And, and then this is also, I mean, and this is very anecdotal, but in my case, it has to do with having been a drummer in a former life so that the way the world comes through my mind through natural disposition, but then also through having the habit of thinking about the world as a drummer for many years, the prose in which what I'm trying to describe um, that comes to me comes in the form of um, rhythm. I often when I'm writing, I often know, as it were, um, what the time signature, how many beats there are to a sentence. I know what the rhythm of a sentence is before I know what its literal meaning is. So I... I I, receive, I see the world in terms of rhythm and even tonality, you know. So this is also, this is kind of the, some of the fun that you can have, which is where, you know, synesthesia is kind of a virtue um, with these sorts of things. You can think about senses in terms of one another. Um, you can think about what you're seeing in terms of what it would sound like. You can think of what it sounds like in terms of color, um, I know lots of musicians who do that. They, I know very famous jazz drummers who thought of each cymbal and each drum on his drum kit as a different color. And so he thought of himself as painting while he was playing his drums. Very beautiful. You know, there's, we have big, giant, gorgeous brains that can handle all this sort of stuff. Don't ever write your fiction for bad readers. Write your fiction for good readers who have big, giant brains who want to feast on all this sort of stuff. And not only can take it, but, but want it, you know. We hope you enjoyed those videos, which remind us of the importance of objects, of things. They're really the great master of this was the Russian short story writer and playwright Anton Chekhov. And I am thinking particularly of that wonderful story, The Lady with the Pet Dog, where Dmitry Gorov falls in love with Anna and he goes to visit her in her town and he's standing in this hotel room and he's looking around and his eye is registering different objects. In the middle of one paragraph, there's the most unobtrusive detail. He, read, he sees on the mantle a statue of a man on a horse and the man's head is gone, which is exactly what Dmitry Gorov, that's where he is in his life. His passion has overtaken any sense of reason. I read that uh, paragraph many, many times before a friend pointed out, oh, look, have you noticed this statue? And for me, the great details in, in any fictional context are uh, done seamlessly. You could almost read over it, but that detail has to add up, doesn't it? It absolutely does. And Chekhov is one of the greats as far as when you have a detail, when you have something described in, in a story, it's never just to add, you know, I need, to, I need to build a world, so let's put some trees in it. There's always another level, whether that's a painting that you know, alludes to someone losing their mind, or whether that's you know, a child walking down the street and they're giving you a strange look. All of that adds, adds to what's happening on a larger level in the narrative. It all adds up. Mm -hmm. yeah. Onward. <laughs>